Welcome back to Between Two White Coats, a podcast designed to help you be the healthiest version of yourself. I'm Dr. Michelle Plaster, a family medicine doctor. And I'm her co-host, Amber Foster, a family nurse practitioner. In our combined 30 years in medicine, we've seen a lot. We're discussing key issues surrounding health and wellness, answering some of our biggest questions, overcoming health obstacles, and giving patient-centered advice in hopes of educating you and providing the tools you need to live a healthy life. If you find our podcast helpful, please consider subscribing so you don't miss an episode. And don't forget to leave us a five-star rating and review. This will help other people find our podcast. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to serving you. Welcome back to Between Two White Coats. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you today, Amber? We're good. We got a hot topic, so we do have a hot. We topic. like hot topics, <laughs> and it's a hot topic that is really dear uh, to us. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, it's a uh, we have uh, been really practicing in this hot topic for a, a little bit, like almost ten years. Like it's, it's not. It's, it seems like it's a hot topic right now because it's in a lot of social media. It's getting a lot of recognition from the news outlets, but. We've been using this particular medication for about 10 years or a version right. of it. And it's so interesting when things we've been doing suddenly become in the news. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. What are they talking about? <laughs> if I could just have a backdoor to Kim Kardashian and have her know, like throw a few us. more things out there, yeah. then we could really get people interested in, in a medicine, lot of things yeah. that we're doing. So our topic today is semaglutide. Semaglutide, for those of you who haven't been tuned in to some of the newscasts that have you know been around in the last months. Um, semaglutide is a new prescription, and I say new because it's new in the last 10 years. It's uh, And that's newer as far as prescriptions go, but it's new, new to people actually starting to hear more about it. Um, and, you know, it's on the TikTok. So when so it's, it's on the on, TikTok. And you know, like Shelly and I say, on the TikTok, on the Instagram. Yeah. So if that gives you any indication of how old we yeah, are. Yeah, we like to make sure. We you, like that we have no idea You know that the TikTok. We're, we're not really tuned into the TikTok. This is just what people are telling us. Um, and it's so semaglutide is a prescription that first came out as, um, well, this drug class. Uh, semaglutide is one of the newer to class, um, yeah. maybe midway through. Uh, but this drug class is called GLP-1 agonist, um, and that's because it's a lot of really big words, so we like to uh, abbreviate it, it down. But a GLP-1 agonist is something that our body, uh, the agonist means it's acting just like something in us. GLP-1 is made in our body, it's made in the intestines, and it works on about nine or ten different organs. <clears throat> goes to a lot of different places in the body doing a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that GLP-1 does is go to the pancreas. And it makes the pancreas release insulin when it's needed. And so one of the interesting things about this and what makes it really a great diabetic medication is you will release insulin when your sugar is high. You will not release extra insulin when your sugar is not high. One of the things that happens with diabetics, we don't want to surge insulin when they don't have sugar. They'll go hypoglycemic and can go into a coma and die. And that's, I, I, it's the worst to treat. It's very it's scary. Very scary. And so if we can have diabetic medicines that don't bottom you out, the other issue when we're giving you stuff that releases insulin and then your sugar starts to drop, you have to eat. Even when you're not hungry, you got to load in. And, and so we'll have our diabetics who are trying to work on their weight, trying to lose weight, and then we have them on insulin and they don't eat and then their sugar starts to drop. So now they're swallowing sugar packets. Um, and you get all of these empty sugar calories to save your life. Um, and they can't lose weight because they're on this roller coaster of having to ingest sugar because their sugar got too low. Well, GLP-1s um, and GLP-1 agonists as a drug class are a gift in that they yeah. don't make you go hypoglycemic and that can save people's lives. And so I, one of the places that GLP-1 works is on your pancreas. And that's how this became a uh, really effective diabetic medicine. But it works in a number of other, uh, of other places. It helps your liver to not produce new glucose, gluconeogenesis. Um, and so you're not making glucose when you don't need it. Um, it works on tissues uh, and really makes the entire body react to insulin in a nice way. But it also works on the brain to make you get rid of food cravings, 
and feel less hungry. Um, and that is really a huge thing it, because we've noticed with our type 2 diabetes, uh, diabetics, and please note this is approved for type 2 adult onset diabetes, not type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Um, and so with our type 2 diabetics, they frequently um, become diabetic because of obesity or being overweight. Um, or are struggling with their weight. And if we can get their weight down, we can really improve their sugar levels. But we can give a lot of medicines. Old medicines for diabetes have the side effect of weight gain. Yeah. And so what are we doing to you? We're telling you to lose weight and we're giving you makes, prescriptions to make you gain weight. Yeah, and it makes it really hard to yes. lose it. <laughs> and so in recent years, being the last five to 10 years, we've had some new drug classes come out. The GLP-1s are one of them that had the side effect of weight loss. And semaglutide has a side effect of about 15 to 20% of your start body weight you will lose. That's huge. So if we could give you something to help you lose weight, then um, you can help reverse your diabetes or get it much better controlled. Well, and and I think too, sometimes when you say 15 to 20%, like... I'm not really a math person unless it's shopping. So, but like, if, like making numbers easy, like if you were to weigh 100 pounds, that's 15 to 20 pounds. Like that's yeah. a significant weight loss. Yeah. So a, a 200 pound person loses 30, 40 pounds. Yeah. Um, that gets them down, you know, to normal range. Yeah. And certainly, you have to lose about 10 percent of your body weight to uh, help improve your risk of diabetes. So if you're yeah. borderline diabetic, if we can get you to lose 10 percent you can stop being borderline diabetic. So semaglutide initially approved as a diabetic medicine. Um, As a diabetic medicine, it is called Ozempic. It is a once a week injection. It is not the first GLP-1 that we were introduced to, but it is a newer one. And um, the way that semaglutide is made is it's 94% the same as the GLP-1 in our body. Yeah. The difference, GLP-1 in our body is turned over and broken down really fast and it lasts only minutes. And so what they've done is the smart scientists have found a way to make this last longer. The original GLP-1s that we um, got were injections and they were once Damn. a day. And then we started getting once a week injections because if you have to give yourself a shot, why do you want to give yourself a shot Which, more I, than you want to? And I would, will say, like I would, when I would talk to med, uh, diabetics about this, that's one thing that's an aversion for diabetics is because they think shot insulin. Yes, and that terrifies people. And so, um, but these needles are so tiny. Like I had given patients like their first dose in the clinic from like a sample, or they would bring their medication in, and I'm like, you can barely see the needle. Like it's not painful it is a yes. very small needle but it's still a shot so sometimes there is an aversion yeah the, to that. another huge part of the science that has happened in recent years in a number of arenas is how things are injected and so these come in pins with a tiny little needle you're not having to take a vial pull up a syringe draw it up and so it's much more user friendly yeah. there's less room for error and super easy and really when we give people these these shots they frequently don't even feel it yeah but really easy for people to do themselves in these pen forms. Yeah. Um, and so semaglutide was, uh, came to the market uh, for diabetes as Ozempic. Um, and then the smart people in pharmaceuticals uh, went on to turn it into a pill for diabetes. And that's a once a day pill that has to be taken on an empty stomach. And some of our diabetics will say, oh, I'll just stay on the shot once a week. But others like, no, I really don't like doing, I don't like needles, I don't like doing a shot. And so they'll take the um, the oral form, which is ribelsis. And both, uh, to be clear, FDA approved for diabetes only, semaglutide as a pill of ribelsis, semaglutide as a diabetic injectable, ozempic. Um, when we were giving this medicine to our diabetics, we were recognizing the profound impact of the 15 to 20% of their body weight and weight loss. So then the smart people in pharmaceuticals started saying, well, what about using this as a weight loss medicine? And since it only lowers sugar, if your sugar's high, it's not going to bottom out people who aren't diabetic. Um, but the most profound thing is it really goes to their, their brain and the craving center and makes them not craving food. Um, why does that matter? Is this a crutch? Is this people being lazy? Come on, just where's your uh, um, ability to fight through it? Um, like no one has the ability to fight through it. You right. know, like it's just not human nature. You it's, know, like it is 100% not human nature. This isn't a willpower thing. Yeah. This is a 
body telling you what it needs to do to stay alive. Because unfortunately, when your body uh, gains weight, it does not see normal BMI as being the weight it's trying to maintain. Our bodies aren't used to our current lifestyle. Um, our bodies don't know that we now don't hunt and gather, um, that we have access to food that can sit on the shelf for six years. Um, our bodies don't know that. Our bodies know that we can starve to death. And so if you gain weight to 400 pounds, your body sees 400 pounds as the weight it must sustain. It, your current weight, your highest weight, is the one that your body thinks it needs to sustain. So when you start losing weight, your body thinks it's starving. Um, it's going and you may to, think you're starving. You're and, not, but you may think you, you are. You may, and your body is making you think you're starving because you start to release ghrelin, which is a, um, hunger. a hunger hormone, goes to your brain and says, you're starving, go eat. You need sugar. You need these other things. You don't actually need those things, but it is a response to weight loss. The unfortunate thing is you don't always change that when you lose weight. And so people who have struggled with obesity and morbid obesity will realize if their body's been at 400 pounds and they're sustaining 180, it is not the same for some people as someone else who's always been 180 and is sustaining 180. Yeah. They're making hormones that their body is saying, you're starving. We were once 400 pounds and that's where we need to be. So you need to eat, you need to eat. So th some of the controversy around semaglutide and weight loss drugs becomes, well, do you have to use it the rest of your life? Um, and it, once again, it depends on who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no way to say that. I think people like to, some of the controversy around semaglutide um, is that we want to make it one size fits all and we want to make it simple. Um, and medicine isn't simple and it's 100% not one size fits all. So if you, if you just Google podcast on semaglutide, you're going to get some health coach who is cussing about it saying worst thing ever. Can't believe you irresponsible doctors are giving this to people. You need to just diet and exercise. Which we and agree with. You need to diet and exercise a thousand percent while you're taking semaglutide. A thousand percent. <laughs> and if you have mental issues that are making you eat, if you have um, eating disorders, uh, if you have trauma or anxiety or depression, you need to get those things treated. If you mm -hmm. have other medical conditions, we need to address that. Semaglutide is not the magic anything. No. Um, but to, to simplify um, obesity into saying just lose weight, just diet and exercise – Goodness, when people sit in front of us, they've already tried that. Mm -hmm. I, I've yet in 20 years to have a patient come sit in front of me and say, can you help me lose weight? And they haven't tried diet and exercise. And often they're tearful. Like they're so frustrated. Obesity is difficult. It is it hard. It is. And there are some people who have been 50 pounds, 100 pounds overweight, and they lose and they sustain and they don't need anything. And so first, and, and we have an entire episode about um, being overweight and all the different weight loss medications that are out there. Um, but first, we really need to appreciate that obesity is a chronic progressive disease and obesity changes your body. Fat cells are little endocrine organs. They are making hormones and they are changing your internal physiology. Um, when you have been at a certain weight, your appetite hormones change and and fat uh can change all of, of how your body's working. So for in some degrees, and then also obesity is a genetic disorder for a lot of people. There are a thousand genes, um, over a thousand genes that can cause obesity. That's not in everyone. Yeah. You know, not, people can have diabetes and not have the genetic load for it. It's just their lifestyle. People can have obesity. It's just their lifestyle. Other people, they have the genetic load. So we have to really address each person and what their situation is. Um, but for people who have the fat cells have kind of helped change what's going on, they lose weight, can they come off of the semaglutide? Yeah, they have fewer fat cells. They may notice that they don't need weight loss drugs anymore. If it's a genetic thing, if they're having huge amounts of ghrelin making them hungry, then um, they may not be able to come off of it and succeed. So do you have to be on it forever? We can't answer that. We're going to treat the person in front of us, give them the tools they need to be as healthy as possible. And some people are going to need to be sustained in this uh, medication if they're using it for weight loss. Um, but uh, it's part of the controversy that's around semaglutide. 
Um, so semaglutide, great diabetic medicine. Nobody argued against that. Um, uh, we have a rep that has come and called on us um, where semaglutide has been his product. Great guy. And, and he's really helped educate us on semaglutide. And he talks a lot about how semaglutide works in your body and how it helps diabetes but also how in working that same way, it helps weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, so we've learned a lot over the years about semaglutide with weight loss. So semaglutide later got approved as Wagovi as a weight loss prescription. And it's a higher dose. So the just... only difference is more milligrams. Yeah. New name, higher dose. Ozempic up to two milligrams mm -hmm. now. Wagovi up to 2.4 milligrams. For a yeah. while, Ozempic's max, do max dose was one milligram. Yeah. Now it's up to two milligrams. Um, and so... Um, Wagovi is now approved as a weight loss medicine. It's semaglutide at a higher dosing. Um, are we fans of Wagovi? Do we think it's a good idea? Absolutely. We love All it. The time. We love it. I honestly can't tell you that there's been very many things that have happened in the last few years in medicine that have made me more excited because, um, and here's why. So to anyone who's, you know, really on the soapbox that doesn't sit with patients in front of them, um, in a health arena, just going to ask you to step back and get in your lane. Um, God bless all of the nutritionists and the functional med people and whatever else. I'm not, I'm not speaking ill about you. Talk about nutrition. Talk about how people need to do these things to lose weight. But don't bash a drug that you don't have the ability to prescribe. Yeah. Those of us who are prescribers are pretty passionate about this because we've had people sit in front of us. And we've seen some of the um, disadvantages of the types of weight loss that they're trying to do. We've seen them cry. We've, we are seeing the profound impact. And that when they say, I've tried everything, they're not lying. Yeah. Um, and they're at their wit's end. And so if we have a tool available to us to help control your diabetes, we're going to use it. If we have a tool available to us to help control your morbid obesity, which is a chronic progressive disease, not a choice, we're going to use it. Yeah. And obesity is not, not only is it a chronic progressive disease, but it also, people will become depressed. Like it causes yes. other things that are not metabolic. Yes. Like it causes, you know. Moms don't want to get in pictures with their kids. You know, they're depressed about things. They are always are self-conscious. Um, and so it becomes more than just a metabolic disease. It can be really affect mental health. Yes. And um, and then you get to where, because you're carrying around extra weight, you've worn out your joints, so you need double knee replacement. And then the orthopedic says, well, you can't get double knee replacement until you lose 50 pounds because you're not a good surgical candidate and you'll wear out the New knee ones. replacements. And so... You know, the orthopedics doing exactly what they should, but when they sit in front of us, we have to help them get to a place where they can't exercise well, they can't move around well, they're depressed, they have all these things working against them. They need a tool. Yeah. They need a tool. And and are we going to just hand them a prescription and go, go to it? Yeah. yeah. No. We're on your team. We're going to work on diet and exercise and we're going to give you all the other tools while you're learning um, how to change your lifestyle so that we have the most success as fast as we can. So semaglutide has really been a gift to medical providers who care about the world yeah. of obesity. And I still see my patients with that are on semaglutide um, every month. Yeah. Like it's not like I'm like, oh, here's a year's prescription. Good luck and and, Maybe and, you'll figure out diet and exercise. Like I, I'm hounding them. Yes. I'm like, okay, what else can we do? What, uh, you know, what dietary changes have you made? How do you feel? What exercises? Like I'll challenge them. I'm like, I always tell them the first visit I'm really nice, and then after that I'm not. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's get warm up to this fact. Like let's talk about diet and exercise. And I'm like, then when you return, like I will give you steps. Like you'll you will lose weight if you do what I say. Yes. But I'm going to push you. And we're um, having accountability visits. Yes. And we're action planning. Yeah. And they are changing what they do yeah so that as the semaglutide helps them lose weight we are also helping them create a healthier lifestyle mm -hmm. um, and some of them will be able to sustain the weight loss without the semaglutide some may not based on their physiology um, semaglutide in general uh, very effective for weight loss if I can help you lose 20% of your body weight I'm gonna do that yeah well and of course it um, I've seen patients be able to come off other medications because they've lost weight so like their blood pressure medications you know they may have to stay on blood pressure medicines but they may have went from a 20 milligram to a 5 milligram yes um, you know and we haven't mentioned this yet but um, in practice we have seen things like um, and there's data to support this but like cardiovascular health 
for some glutide, some glutide and um, fatty liver. Like that is what I say will be the disease that kills my generation is yes. because we're the fast food generation. Yes. And so fatty liver is a big deal. I have seen it. Um, I've been here at this Never for, thought I'd diagnose it so much. All the time. All and, the time. I mean, in the last eight years, I've been here eight years and it has been probably the last five. I have been like, why are everyone's liver enzymes elevated? Like, yeah. this is crazy. Don't be fooled, listeners. If you have visceral fat, belly, belly fat. fat, if you have that uh, beer belly, um, you likely have fatty liver. Yeah. Uh, alcoholic cirrhosis is no longer the number one type of liver failure and cirrhosis. No. It is non-alcoholic fatty liver from belly fat. Which, and I don't, and I say this to patients when we're talking about this because I'm like, no, no, no. This is progressive. Like, this is a very big deal. Like, you will end up with cirrhosis potential liver transplant. Yes. Like, it's not a fun road. No, it's um, not. It can be your cause of death. And um, and we are finding that semaglutide is helping people lose their visceral fat and helping liver enzymes, enzymes. return to normal. Yeah. Not approved for a treatment for fatty liver, but certainly something kind of that we label. think about. You know, if you're obese and I can give you Wagovi as a prescription and that's going to help you lose weight and reverse your elevated liver enzymes to normal, then yeah. I'm, I'm potentially saving your life from cirrhosis. Yeah. And I, we often say, you know, people come to us with problems. Um, there are some patients that are good. You know, they're, we've, we've trained them, I say, or like someone trained them well to like go for their annual physical. But a lot of times we meet people kind of where there is already an issue. You know, they're, they're obese or they have been diagnosed with diabetes or they just don't feel well. They can't put their finger on it. It ends up being something like fatty liver. Um, so a lot of times we're kind of, behind yeah. treatments. Yeah. So if I can if I can amp it up and go ahead and say, hey, let's do this now so that in 10 years you're not on a transplant list, right. that's a big deal to me. Yes, and if I can get your liver enzymes down faster, get your weight down faster um, by giving you a prescription, I feel like I would be negligent not to. Yeah. It's the same thing with a diabetic. I'm not going to – you know what fixes diabetes for a lot of people? cutting out your carbs, diet and exercise, but I'm still going to give you a prescription to get that A1C down faster. Then hopefully we come off those prescriptions and you can keep it down with diet and exercise. Yeah. Um, so we, we mentioned uh, that fatty liver is improved with semaglutide, um, heart disease. So heart attacks and strokes. We, uh, there's research that supports um, and the FDA is approving semaglutide to reduce uh, primary and secondary prevention of heart attacks and strokes, and that is isolated from A1C uh, reduction. Yeah. And so it is not now being used as a prevention for this in non-diabetics, but I think we'll see it. Now, if, you have, if we have a person in front of us who's morbidly obese, I am most certainly concerned about their cardiovascular health. Yeah. I am worried about heart attack and stroke in that person. So if I can help you lose weight while decreasing your risk of heart attack and stroke by 30 percent um and decreasing your fatty liver um that sounds like a great idea yes. that's and, that's good medicine and recently um like real recently this year um the guidelines for how we treat diabetes have changed to so um, I know sometimes you guys think that we are just like, oh, here's this medication, but there is a There's, method there to our madness. There are reasons why we chose that one. <laughs> um, there are reasons. And so typically in the past, it has been metformin. Um, but now GLP-1s have surpassed where they're saying this you can, can be do a, this first as a first line. line. Not that metformin will go away, but... Um, but you can use the GLP-1s as a first-line treatment because we've seen such significant Yeah, um, There's advantages. even some research on semaglutide now as to whether it can help um, decrease progression of dementia. And that's just in the research phase. But it'll be interesting to see how that has an effect. Um, so semaglutide really has profound effect in a lot of areas. Um of course, before we give it to anyone for diabetes or weight loss, we're going to look at the risk-benefit analysis. There are risks of anything you put into your body, um, prescriptions included. And so uh, we're going to look at what are the side effects. If you have had certain thyroid, medullary thyroid cancers, then you are not a good candidate for this. Which is rare. So very rare. Very and rare. in research, I think a lot of a lot of people who um, support semaglutide and feel like it makes a big difference for people kind of wish this wasn't a black box warning because it's only been found in rats. We haven't yet to see it in humans. But the FDA yes. is stringent on these things and helps us know what is or isn't safe. Um, and so someone who has that, not a great candidate. If someone has a history of pancreatitis, because this acts on the pancreas, can in some people cause inflammation of the pancreas. 
Um, I've had to remove patients from GLPs uh, other than semaglutide um, because of pancreatitis. And yeah. so if you get pancreatitis, we're going to remove it. Pancreatitis goes away. You don't get it back. Um, and so there are certain things that make this not a good idea for you. Um, and then the number one side effect is GI side effects, nausea, um, sometimes vomiting, uh, diarrhea. diarrhea. But they're transient, usually. Yes. And like, so most of the time, we start you at a low dose. You get used to it. And then we go up slow. Um, you get the maximum weight loss at the highest doses. So we try to titrate people up who are trying to lose weight. But some people won't get to the max dose. They'll say, you know, I could, I could do great at one milligram. But anything above that just kept me nauseated. And so we go back to one milligram where they feel good um, and and it tends to work well. So this is going to be very patient specific and will keep you at the dose that works well for you, educate you about the side effects and and make sure that you're, you know, being monitored. Yeah. Um, all of this to say, I think you can, you can recognize the takeaway from Amber and I is that we are happy that science has found new tools yeah. and we're going to stay on top of knowing the science behind that, knowing who it's safe for and who it can help. Um, it's always interesting to me that these things become so controversial and I think it becomes because we want to oversimplify it. Mm-hmm. We want to say semaglutide, good or bad. Um, and that's not how medicine works. Yeah. It's not that simple. Uh, there are people it's going to be very good for, and there are people it's going to be bad for. Um, but in our experience, it has been a game changer yeah. and allowed us to really profoundly improve people's health. So um, we are going to continue to prescribe, prescribe semaglutide yeah. and um, recognize the profound impacts that it's having for the people it's appropriate for. we like to end you on a good note. Today's Tell Me Something Good is from one of our medical assistants, Vanessa. Vanessa's Tell Me Something Good is that her mom is coming up on a one-year remission of her breast cancer. No question, something good is healing, and particularly healing of cancer. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, take care of yourself.